I know most of you have things to do, but I do want to give everybody an opportunity who wants to to ask a question of uh, uh, Henry here. So who will get, who will get us started here? Robert. And, uh, and you know, there's, as, you, as you well know, there are so many different sort of ways to do a performance review. I, I think, um, so I'm gonna share with you, frankly, a little bit more of kind of principles, because to me, the process, there's a lot of different ways to apply the principles. And of course, it's sort of the basis of what I've been saying all evening. It's that one applies some of these key principles. So one of which on performance review, of course, is to be very, very clear on expectations. So on my management team, I'm pretty clear in terms of these are the expectations. And I'm more focused around um, outcomes and behaviors rather than necessarily a skill, because the skills are almost obvious. But you, I mean, you got to, depending on how, what the level you are, right, skills come into play more. But it's really about outcomes and sort of behaviors. So I'm very, very clear on that. The second, so you got to do that. <laughs> Very clear. And remember what I said earlier, especially for anyone who's part of a team, whether that's an executive or a manager or otherwise, you want to be clear on what you expect of the individual sets of responsibilities, but what you expect in terms of them being on the team. Like I expect certain things of someone being on the Smith Buckland management team that's different than their particular role heading up marketing, say. Okay, so clarity on both individual and being on the team is certainly important. The second principle is around ongoing. I mean, this concept of performance review is almost a little silly. There should be no surprises. You should be having discussions with your folks all the time. The performance review is really almost more of an opportunity, you know, just to sort of review what everything you've talked about and maybe reflect on some things about uh, the year and, and about next year. So that's the second. Third is I'm very, um, I'm very oriented face-to-face. -to -face. So I don't do a lot of writing, just some key things. Um, now that's harder to do if you're at the lower end because you need to document things, blah, blah, blah. But, but certainly at the executive level, it's more about, again, the interaction and the talking rather than writing some five page, six, seven page, you know, performance, you know, review. And then the, the, the last piece on, on the, uh, two more things. The, one is um, I ask penetrating questions so that they can reflect upon the past year rather than me telling them, right? So um, reflect on the past year and what do you think, you know, what do you think you've accomplished this past year? How do you think you did against your goals? What might you have done differently? Where, where was your one major disappointment? You know, it's a the number of questions like that. How do you think you did against my expectations of being on this management team? Um, what are you worried about the future? And what do you need from me? Because the other piece is there's a lot of um, CEOs or senior executives uh, that take the attitude that you're on my team, this is what I expect that you're gonna report to me, this is what I wanna see, blah, blah, blah. I, I sort of take a different approach. I'm here to serve you, right? My goal is to make sure two things. I'm clear on expectations and for you to be successful. So if all goes well, you get a lot out in the answers to your own questions. Right, for the yeah, that's right. But, but the point I was gonna make though is what do you need from me and how do I best serve you? So for example, I have members on the team, on my management team, who are very uh, structured and they like to have a weekly meeting with me or bi-weekly. There are others who just want to be able to pick up the phone and call me or come and see me. It's fine. You know, e either is fine because again, it's, I, can, I can be diverse enough or versatile enough to 
so I can serve them best. And I think that's key. It's really important. And you've got to believe it. It can't be because, oh, aren't I a good guy because I'm doing this. You've got to really believe it. My job, clear expectations, and how do I inspire and enable you to do great work and to fulfillment. And, you know, that, that's it. It's kind of basic in many ways. I liked your comment earlier when you compared a CEO versus a leader. CEOs in today's world are easily judged, share value, so on and so forth, economic value added, et cetera, et cetera. In your position as CEO, president, and chairman, how do you judge yourself if you're not judging yourself on the metrics? How do you judge yourself then on your leadership skills? How, how, do, you, how do you know that actually you're, you're walking the talk. Yeah, yeah. no, great, great question. And, and let me be clear. I didn't say that um, a CEO isn't a leader, a leader isn't a CEO. I said it's not automatic. So what I mean by that is that if you're strictly a CEO, this is what you do, the things that I mentioned. But if you're a leader CEO, then obviously you do those things, but then you also do the, you know, you're, you're also this other side, which is being a leader CEO. A CEO is not an automatically a leader. That, that's what I meant. So of course, you have certain measurements. By the way, those measurements are related to the outcomes. Remember what I said that the three components of leadership is visualizing a better state in the future, getting others to join, and then getting there. Well, the getting there is some of those measurements. The question is, can you do both? Right, it's the and. In my judgment, there should never be a um, mutually exclusive, that you're going for the certain results and outcomes. Look, we're running businesses. You've got to be able to be profitable. You know, growth and financial performance enables a lot of things, and it protects what you've built, and it allows you to do other great things. Right? Growth enables scale. So financial performance, growth, all those things are pretty critically important. But here's a subtlety. They should be the scorecard, not the driving force. And that's the subtlety. I don't, know, I don't know how else to explain it. I mean, it's, you know, if, if you're just going, if, if my whole goal is just to increase profits and increase market share, something's lost. I can do that short term. But if I want to build something that's great and enduring, the other things have to, have, have to be there as well. And so, the, so then the results are the scorecard, not the driving force. And when you see companies um, that have a couple good years and then don't, I mean, how many companies, you guys, today really have endured? Remember, in, well, you're all young. Yeah, it's in search of excellence, remember? Do you know that's probably, I don't know if there's any companies that in search of excellence are still either even, even around or at their top of their game. It's very, very difficult to pull off. But frankly, most CEOs, to be blunt, most, that's not fair. You would think that many CEOs, at least the way they behave, they're not worried about endurance and greatness. They're only concerned about short term. Look, all my employees have heard me say this, and it's not BS, and I mean it. The mark of a great leader is as much what happens after they're gone as it is while they're on the job. If I get hit by a car tomorrow and the company tanks, what the hell does that say about me as a leader? When I retire, step down, whatever, the company should take off, continue to take off. And if it doesn't, I am not. I, don't ha I have not earned, in my judgment, to be called a leader. Good CEO. The um, executive MBA group out in Cincinnati would like to know if you can expand upon termination with a big heart a little bit. Yeah, so, so big heart means, means a couple things. Um, it means that you honor the individual by being straight. Um, that's one. That's what a big heart to me means. You, again, you, you honor them by being straight, by being truthful. Um, now, you've got to do it with diplomacy. You, you, there's no reason to hurt someone, but you have to be straight. We don't do any justice to anyone by continuing to give people sort of good performance reviews when they're not performing. In our company, we try hard to reward our top performers, 
help our average performers to become top performers and ask our non-performers to go somewhere where they can be top performers. So, the, so the, again, going back, big heart means you got to be straight. Second component to big heart is how you handle it, especially with executives. Punitive action is not necessary. So how things are handled, how they're communicated, how the individual leaves, that's also big heart. And third, look, I am a believer in the right context that executives take big risks when they join companies. And therefore, that's why there are several, I'm not big on the ridiculous severance package that exists out there, but there is something to be said for a, a financial you know, sort of safety net for executives because they take much bigger risks and it takes much longer time. Uh, and by the way, they can be let go much easier. To be honest, there's very little that as I CEO, I can go to a senior executive and say, you know what? We have to make a change. And the reason is it's not a good fit. Right? So those are sort of the three components of the big heart, is what I was referring to. I'll, I'll speak up. It's good. They can't hear you. Okay. Hi, uh, John Bia. Good evening. Thank you for coming. Pleasure. Um, I'm wondering what's been, doesn't have to be your greatest, but a failure as a leader that you've had that you've recovered from and restored the faith in your followers to want to continue to be led by you? Um, well, you know, it, 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 that, that's a hard one if you mean in terms of followership. Um, I can't think of a situation where at least I observed. Now, that's also, and I will say I'm not perfect. Maybe I missed it. Uh, but that certainly can happen. And um, trying to think on the, your specific question about the followers, I can certainly think of situations where there were mistakes made, again, from business you know, decisions. Uh, but I can't think of a specific situation where I felt like I lost one or two individuals from that perspective. It might have not worked out because it wasn't a good fit or they weren't happy with a decision or direction I made. Uh, but I can't think of one, again, where it was sort of, we're not following you anymore. Uh, because I, I really work at that pretty hard. I know that's a lousy answer. I'm, I'm sure I can think of one, but not, not right this moment. Okay. Thank you. You uh, made an analogy between uh, leadership in the plant kingdom and growth and shedding. In your career, what was that critical moment where you shed something that propelled you into becoming a leader? Um, well, I, again, I wouldn't say, I, I don't believe in these bursts, this propelling. Um, I, I think it's, a, again, a journey of, of steps and incremental and, and learning. And, and by the way, that does sometimes mean this, and then you do this, right? Scott in Cincinnati asked, how have you created shared values and culture in your time at Smith Buckland? Well, there's, there's, a, there's a number of things. Um, you know, one, is I, I'm a strong believer around culture and values that every organization has a culture, whether it's well-defined or not, because culture, by definition, is the way people behave, the way people do things, right? The way there's customs. And, and as such, every organization, every family, every group of people has a culture. The question is, is it the right one? And is it uh, well-articulated? And is it nurtured and protected? And so one of the things when I came back to Smith Buckland in two, 2002 that I really focused on was culture. And I, I will tell you, my board, some of my manager teams said, what the hell are you focused on that for? Well, you got to do the other things too, like grow the business. But culture was a piece that was really important. And one of those was is really understanding what is the right culture for our company? Right? Because every company is different. It's not a matter of one culture being better than the other. I mean, Oracle's culture, Oracle, the technology company, is very, very different than Smith Buckland's culture, but, it, but Oracle's culture works for Oracle. So the first piece was getting my arms around what aspects of our culture was right, meaning that it really created the right conditions to be successful and enduring as a company. And then what things did we need to infuse? And once you determine that, then you have to make sure that one, you're a role model, two, that you expect your management team to be role models, three, that you hire people very carefully to ensure that you're not only looking for skills, right, but that would be a good fit, you know, within, within your culture. 
And so that's how you get to do we share the same values. Got to articulate it. Got to make sure it's the right ones that work for your organization. Got to develop it, nurture it, protect it. Oust, sorry to use a strong word, but oust people that don't embody and live it. Make people accountable. Right? And that's how you get to that shared meaning and values. Continuing with the growth uh, example, there was also leverage. In order to have leverage, you need a fixed point. Which is your fixed point, and how do you measure that is the right one? Well, talk some more, because leverage is different mean. To me, leverage means that one has to have self-knowledge about what one's strengths are and what one's natural gifts are and to focus um, your situations and what you do around those strengths. And, and leverage is about constantly growing right, around those skills and strengths. Because so often as people, we focus on our weaknesses. Right? I'm not good at this. i got to focus on this. And we oftentimes let go of what really makes us unique and where our natural you know, gifts and talents are. Um, so I don't know what you mean, the, the point. Yeah, what you're saying is more the adding value in terms of making growth of, of those strengths that you have. But if in order to leverage, from my point of view, you have to have a strong foundation mm -hmm. in order to be able to grow. And that's, that's your fixed point. And, so, so, so and that will be what kind you... of values or, or which us where do you think that it's a good point to fix in order to, to give this uh, extra step? I'm not following you. So tell me, so how would you answer it? So maybe you can help if you were answered, if you could answer it. I would say it's your personal values and, and which okay. are your, your deeply rooted uh, guiding light in order to say this is right and this is wrong. So my question is, how do you value that okay. for an organization? Okay, so, okay. so I th heard, heard of different things. When I was talking about leverage in terms of growth, it was around your skills and talents and your, you know, your natural abilities. That, that's what I was referring to. What you're referring to is what I was saying earlier about who you are at the core, right? What your spoken and lived chosen values are and what your purpose in life is. Right, and your professional mission. That, you got to discover that for yourself. If you're asking me what mine is, you heard a lot of it today. Uh, I mean, you heard a lot of it. And the thing that oftentimes I think we miss is that we don't share it, those things with those around us. You know, you become CEO. And it's like all of a sudden, uh, you know, I have this cocoon around me, right? And we don't tend to share those you know, with others. And most importantly, to your point, which is what I said earlier, is you, your actions and choices and behaviors have to consistently and genuinely connect to who you are in your life story. If it doesn't, people will know. You know, people will know. Um, you, yeah. You said that the first step towards becoming an effective leader is to visualize a better future. Well, there have been people who have visualized a future which was not better, but yet have managed to lead millions of people, like Hitler, Mussolini, Pol Pot. So what I ask is, better is a matter of opinion. You bet. How do you know that what you think is better is actually better? What kind of collaboration do you seek? Yeah, no, look, it's a great question. It's an absolutely great question. And that's why, uh, we're not islands, right? That's why you're, and I even hadn't talked about this, leaders often, not often, by definition, will have a covenant among a very strong set of people, people in their sort of network. I don't mean network the way we often use network where you go to meetings and you hand out business cards. I mean those really trusted, deep relationships that you form, by the way, within the company and without the company, you know, outside the company. And so to your point, how do you know? Well, leaders imagine a better future based on who they are and their view and their beliefs based on their knowledge and experience of their organization. Now, you're right. You're absolutely right. They could be wrong. Or their vision is not based in 
uh, strong moral compass. Okay, well, by definition, I believe that leaders do have strong moral compasses, so in that case, they wouldn't be a leader in my definition. But your point is very well taken, which is, goes back to, again, you want to make sure you have people around you that you can have these trusted relationships and have these discussions and can challenge you. Remember I said earlier about the self-awareness, self-knowledge, and self-confidence? That goes back to that. You must have people around you that are willing to challenge and to tell you the truth look, we know that there's a problem with this in politics and in business. People get into these top positions and, and, and they sort of surround themselves with individuals that are not straight with them. There's a whole body of knowledge and study around this concept of leadership. If you take the definition too strictly, then you're right. Bad people, under some definitions, can be leaders, right? To your point can lead a whole mass of people down a very wrong path. Well, again, in my definition, it's that moral compass that balances that. I don't know if that helps. Thank you. Yep. Um, my question was, what do you do to cultivate leaders around you? It's actually two parts. And the second part is, um, what do you do to cultivate a cohesive team? And in terms of like activities or individualized coaching, yeah, so, so two questions. The first one around the, the leadership. I, I, you, you may be surprised to know um, that if I were to do a real analysis of my time every day, uh, more than 50% is spent on one-on-one, -on, -one, on one or two, one-on-three discussions with, with my executive team. Um, talking about things and discussing and debating real life situations that all revolve around, frankly, at the end, it's a teachable moment, it's all revolving around effectiveness around leadership. So that's done all the time. I mean, that's just a very high priority for me. And trust me, there are tons of opportunities to do that. Why? Because we're human beings. And no matter how um, close we are or know how connected we are with our colleagues, we're human beings and stuff's going to happen. Or with clients, misunderstandings and how you make judgment calls. So there's moments every day and the question is, do you take the time to sort of you know, have that discussion and review and debate and teach? Remember I said you can't learn leadership, but you can present ideas and concepts for those uh, for those to learn. I say you can't teach it. Um, so that's one. Now, there's a, another formal aspect to this, and I'll share this with you. It's a dream that I've had for, for a number of years. Um, we are launching a very special, unique, compelling leadership learning program within Smith Buckland next year. And it's a very unique structure, and it's a real gift to the participants. And it's going to be based on um, this leadership framework. And I've tapped into someone that I've known for 25 years who has a very unique instructional design around learning. And it's a very rigorous year-long program that can, that's, that's reading, that's exercises, that's stimulated debate. It's a lot of components. And, and it's for our top people at various levels cuts across. So it's individuals who already are A players, who've been identified as A players, and who show tremendous potential for executive management. So that's more the, the real formal piece, but there are a gazillion informal things that happen. Again, the trick is, the key, make it a high priority. It's so easy not to. I mean, it really is. It's like communication. It's so easy not to do. It's so easy not to send a handwritten thank you note for something that might have happened that day with an interaction that you had with someone, right? Or, or to send out an email uh, describing a particular situation that just happened within the company that needs maybe a little bit more elaboration and thought. It's just so easy not to do that because we're all so busy. Hi, here. 
Hi, I'm first year MBA student, uh, Alex Wang. Uh, I'm honored to ask the last question. So my question would be, you talk so much about difference of CEO and the true leaders. We know they are, equi they are not quite equivalent to each other. So during the past year, we have, seen, we have seen corporate scandals and we have seen so many astonishing negative news from the financial crisis. So as a, obviously, we failed to get the true leader to some very important business position. Right. And we learned our lesson. So if you were to uh, take a broad view at the system level, what kind of thing, what kind of suggestion you have so that we can improve to let the true leader emerge at the systematic level so that we have a kind of good mechanism, just let the true leader comes up instead yeah. of another shady CEO to take the top position. Yeah, so, so look, there's a, there, unfortunately there isn't an easy answer, but there's a number of thoughts that, that, that I would share with you on this. Um, the first is that to ensure that those in positions to appoint people in positions of power, right, so boards of directors, search committees, whatever, that they do as much rigor and due diligence that they would do like doing an acquisition around an individual's spoken and lived values. And there are ways to do that. We're very smart people to do due diligence, right? We do incredible due diligence around financials, around clients, around HR, around legal. It, it wouldn't be that difficult to do some pretty significant due diligence on someone's background as it relates to their character and their values. Now, you can't legislate that, right? You can't just take a brush broad words say, okay, all boards are going to do this. What you hope you can do is illuminate the topic and the issue enough so that it begins to take some momentum. Right? The other thing you can do, what we're doing tonight, which is, you, and everyone's responsible for this, is to, is to um, help younger people learn and self-discover the incredible fulfillment and contentment one gets from embodying certain tenets and principles that are, that are leadership. And that has to happen at sort of the grassroots. I'm afraid there isn't what I would call a systematic. We seem to relearn this painful lesson time and time again. If you just go back to the corporate scandals and the early to this, before that, here we go again, we relearn this lesson time and time again. Now, I will say this, because I am an optimist. The fact is, a lot of these scandals is what we hear about. There are countless and countless of leader CEOs in our country, right? Managing a lot of businesses that you've never heard of. Unfortunately, there's also the ones that you get a lot of the attention and can really, right, wreak havoc on, on our society. So I'm sorry, I don't have I don't have the magic, uh, the magic answer. Okay. One more. Uh, it's all right. Rob asked it already, so. I was going to ask the same question that Rob asked, so. Sorry. Uh, so, Henry, I'm sure if you have a personal question, you'll stick around for a few minutes. Sure, of course. Uh, answer those, but uh, thank you so much for Pleasure. your time and wisdom with us tonight. It was very uh, significant. Thank you. Thank no, you. I appreciate it. It was a pleasure. Thank you.